Cats, today's gonna be a short one, at least I hope so. I know that I can go on and on and on talking, and that's because this is important to me, and I get excited about it, and there's a lot to say. It's a really big topic. In the spirit of that, when I start doing these essential baselines, I'm trying to get to what is the most authentic thing that the player played that we're talking about. It's important to me, and I think should be to you, that we look at what is the truth of what was played so that we can change it. Oftentimes, when folks are imitating great recordings, they're missing some important, minor details that really can make or break a performance. So, stick around and we're gonna check out the intro to the famous Blue Bossa. Welcome to Learn Jazz Bass with Matt Rubicki. If you're interested in hearing more about how to play jazz bass, please subscribe and check for a link below in the description box for a free PDF of this intro that we're talking about today. So this is Butch Warren's bass line on the famous Blue Bossa from Joe Henderson's page one. And I have a feeling that Butch created this kind of on the spot. I could be wrong and if someone knows better, please correct me. But the reason I think that he created it on the spot is that it's slightly refined over the course of these eight measures. And we'll see what we're talking about in just a second. So let's take a look first at the harmony really quickly. Basically, he is implying a C minor nine chord. If you remember, a C minor seven chord would be C, E flat, G, and B flat. The nine would be D, so the second degree of the C major scale. And the reason he's implying, I say he's implying this nine is because he actually plays that D to C. The first notes are C, which I play on my, with my fourth finger on the A string. This would be your third fret on electric. Next note is E flat, first finger on the D string. Next note is G uh, natural, which I play open, partially because it gives us time to move our hand to this D here in the middle of the neck. So this is a great opportunity as well for you if you're working on getting to this note that you are able to check the intonation of this D against the open G that you've just heard. So we wanna have this sound. Star Wars, nothing but Star Wars. <laughs> Perfect fifth. So it's C, E flat, G, D, C. Now that's the first measure that anticipates measure two. In measure two, he does something different in this sort of repetition of these two, this two measure idea. He does something slightly different almost every time. And this is what gives me the idea that he probably refined it in the moment that quickly during the recording or maybe on the second take. The reason I say this is because of his use of harmonics in this part. So the very first repetition of this two measure phrase, G natural, and then he plays the G, uh, open G natural again, and then the D harmonic, and then the G natural again. So this whole first two measures, and if you are not familiar with how to get harmonics on the instrument, check it out, it's not that hard at all. The idea is that um, the distance between the nut here and the bridge, and this is the same on electric, if you cut that distance exactly in half, this would be the 12th fret on electric, and for us it's the beginning of thumb position, you get the octave of the open string. So we have open G here, and here is the octave, the higher octave of that same note, G natural. Now at that location, if I lightly touch the string, instead of pressing it down, I get the same pitch that's created from the overtone series. I believe I'm understanding that correctly. So, there, and there are many harmonics all up and down the instrument. This one comes out very strong, and if you notice, is lasts a long time, tends to be quite present, and is also easy to grab because the space for this note is actually quite wide. It doesn't have to be right on the location to get that G harmonic, but you should strive to do that. Check it out. If you're having trouble finding it, take a bow, lightly put your hand on the string, draw the bow continuously, and make your hand go up and down the string, just lightly touching it. You're hearing this sort of squeaking, but you hear those notes. 
moving, right? The higher harmonics, the higher overtones. Those are all harmonics. But as we get closer to that location where the G is, watch this. Did you hear it jump out? I'm not changing anything, not the bow speed, not the bow weight, not my hand weight, anything. It just naturally sort of comes out. So it will, should be relatively easy for you to find the general location. Now the issue is, as I said, it's quite wide. Look how much I can move my finger and get that, that note. So you very well may not be right on the right spot, and we should be. If I put my finger down, we should check that we're on the right spot. I'm not really at the right spot there. I'm slightly sharp. You hear it? I'm slightly flat. That's better, closer. So I wanna make sure I am in the accurate spot though because there's a very good chance I want to play this closed or pressed down, not the harmonic. So I wanna have my hands in the right position all the time. These harmonics occur on all the strings. G, D, E, A, and there's more. I use these harmonics for tuning. I'm slightly out of tune right now. They're very useful too because we can jump around quickly because they're sort of fast to grab it. In other words, it doesn't take a lot of accuracy as we just heard to get that note out. So you can make a quick jump from here to there, sort of missed it there, and get your hand back really quickly and that note is still ringing. So it's effective, it's, it's an effective tool and it's kind of a cool sound. Back to the line, Butch uses the D harmonic in this first iteration of this two measure phrase and then plays the open G. Here's why I think that he's doing it in the moment because on the next iteration, it's the first part is the same, C, E flat, G, D, C, G. Now he uses two harmonics. He plays the G and the D harmonic. So this second one is, and he plays the open G for the last part. He plays this again in the next two measures. So I think he feels like, I like that. I like what's happening there. I've created that in two measures. It's working, I'm gonna do it again. Then the last iteration of this two measures, he plays all harmonics. that sort of sings, right? And so that's my guess. I could be wrong, but my guess is he sort of experimented with it and or missed it. He may have been trying in the first time to play the G harmonic and didn't make it. That's very common. He may have been trying to play this and didn't quite press it correctly and ended up playing the lower octave. It's very possible. Who knows? If you know, let me know. So these uh, harmonics are really, really effective generally to use for us across wherever they're ap applicable. In this tune, in Blue Bossa, he continues this rhythmic and intervallic idea in the head. And I think that it's worth transcribing that as well, or at least listening really carefully and trying to mimic that. When we play the tune, it's a little boring to do the standard generic Bossa feel for this. It just kind of doesn't match the tune to me, but then again, this is sort of the definitive recording of this tune, so it's a little bit obje uh, subject, uh, subjective on my part. But nonetheless, I think it's good to have this uh, more active line at your disposal because I think it adds to the energy of the tune. So that's it. Listen to page one, check out the whole tune Blue Bossa, listen carefully for those small details. I hope that you've got something out of this video today. Thanks for joining me. And please remember to subscribe, like, look for the free PDF below, and always remember, straight ahead and strive for tone.